clicker. Okay. All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, <laughs> thank you, Chetty Crowd. Um, my name is Emily Leitleitner. I'm the curatorial assistant at the FIA. You probably have not seen me up here before. It's my first time giving an introduction, but I'm so glad to have you here. <laughs> Thanks. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you. Uh, we are here for this evening's Sheppy Dog Fun Lecture. Tonight we have Dr. Michael Pitlick presenting the Holy Sepulchre of Jerusalem History, Tradition, and Sacred Imagination. Uh, you might recall Dr. Pitlick gave a virtual lecture, New Archaeological Evidence for the Biblical Kingdom of David, on January 11th, 2022. That was virtual and still available on our YouTube channel if you haven't seen it or would like to rewatch it. Um, the Sheppy Dog Fun Lecture Series was established in 2012 by Dr. Alan Klein to address the topics of art, religion, and history prior to the 19th century. Thank you, Dr. Klein, for continuing to bring these wonderful lectures to the FIA. Our next Sheppy Dog Fun Lecture will be uh, on January 18th with Susan Wood, uh, presenting God Kings and Deified Emperors in Ancient Societies. Before I introduce our guest, I would like to thank the Charles Stuart Mott Foundation for their continued support, which is so deeply appreciated and vital to the FIA. Thank you. And I want to thank the citizens of Genesee County uh, for demonstrating their support for the FIA by means of the Genesee County Arts Education and Cultural Enrichment Millage, which also provides free entry to the FIA for Genesee County citizens seven days a week. Thank you. And a big thank you to Huntington Bank for sponsoring Huntington Free Saturdays, which also allows everyone beyond our county free entry on Saturdays. And thank you to the Ford Foundation Equity Fund of the Community Foundation of Greater Flint for making ASL interpretation possible tonight. <laughs> And now please take a moment to silent, silence your electronic devices before I introduce our guest. I don't have mine on me. <laughs> All right. Uh, Dr. Michael Pitlick is the Director of Judaic Studies and Anthropology at Oakland University and Adjunct Assistant Professor in Anthropology and Religion. He's the current faculty advisor for the Jewish Student Organization on campus and the director of the CIS Maisel Center for Judaic Studies and Community Engagement. Uh, Dr. Pitlick is interested in the formation of the Israelite state, the development of the synagogue, Jewish theology, Hebrew, and, archae and the archaeology of Israel. He holds a Doctor of Science in Jewish Studies from Spurtis College, a Master's in Jewish Studies, and a Bachelor's in History. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Dr. Michael Pitlick to the stage. Test. I'm sure this works. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm excited to be here and talk about this. How does a Jewish kid talk about the Holy Sepulchre? Um, <laughs> I'm just fascinated with sacred sites, so I'm wrapping up a course right now at Oakland on sacred sites of the Near East. Of course, this features into it. So uh, let's talk about one of the most confusing buildings in the world. So welcome. And uh, how it got to be what it is. So let's take a quick look here. I won't, I have to talk about some dates, but uh, not, too, not too much, I hope. So uh, let me get over here a little bit. Um, one thing to, to keep in mind is some of the more important periods of history. Uh, Jesus, uh, born about 4 BC, don't ask, and then 33 or so, his death. The Jewish revolt against Rome occurred between 66 and 73. The Jews lost. There was another uh, revolt shortly after that, 60 years later, it's not too short, but the temple was destroyed in the year 70, we just keep that in mind, the Jewish temple, and in the earliest uh, that we have of Jewish Christian movement, Jews who are identifying with the Jesus story, we already have a little bit of evidence in graffiti and some other traditions in the early first century already. Uh, those sites mentioned would be a little bit more um, 
uh, better examples of in the Holy Sepulchre, but we'll get there. Uh, the second Jewish revolt against Rome occurred from 132 to 135, and this has a major impact on the site of the Holy Sepulchre itself, so we want to talk about that. And then the Byzantine Christian Empire, those are the dates. Uh, 330, it becomes an official empire, a Christian empire, and Jerusalem is made into uh, the new Jerusalem, if you will. So how I want to sort of frame all this is the specificity of place. We're going to talk a little bit about this uh, throughout the, the tonight um, and talk about what gives rise to the memories that were enshrined in this location. So it's a complicated history, but it doesn't need to be overly complicated for us tonight. So, meaning takes place in a place. And Jerusalem is the only place where this story can actually come together and be exemplified or be um, told through the Holy Sepulchre itself. So, we're going to look at some sacred images and look at some specific uh, occurrences that occurred in specific times to help us understand this very complex building. All right, so I don't want to go through every one of these, but I guess that's the historian in me to throw a bunch of dates up there and then tell you I'm not going to talk about dates. But nonetheless, the site itself, the site of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, which I'll show you where it is, um, we have ex these are specific key things we got to remember uh, throughout. Is that already in the Iron Age, the ninth century BC, it was a quarry. The site itself was a quarry. If you strip everything away, which is very difficult in Jerusalem because it's so built up, you strip everything away. It was a quarry, a, a rock quarry, a limestone, which is very uh, important ingredient for all the buildings in Jerusalem to this day. Uh, at the time, around the first century, B.C. and C.E., this is B.C.E., meaning before the Common Era, C.E., Common Era, a little bit more politically correct way to say that, B.C. A.D., it was, the site itself was called Golgotha, which is an Aramaic word that means the skull. It's been sort of interpreted by some that this, the place was, you know, looked like a skull carved into the rock somehow by natural formation. But really what that that term means it was a place where people were crucified and a place where people were buried. It's not a good place to go in the Roman period. And it'll be the last place you go in the Roman period. Um, so in the second century in Jerusalem, the emperor Hadrian, who had won that second Jewish revolt against the Jews, outlawed Jews from uh, accessing most of Jerusalem and he leveled the area up, which is, which is now where the Holy Sepulchre is, and he built some temples there. Covered up the whole area, leveled it up very common in our, when we look at archaeology, and then built on top of that. All right, so in the 4th century, when the Christian Empire comes along, the Byzantine Empire, um, they remove a lot of that material, and they come down to the 1st century cemetery, the first century Jewish cemetery, and there the tradition is locked in early on, and the Byzantine emperor under Constantine will build a basilica over this site, which parts of it, which you would see today. The Holy Sepulchre has gone through a lot of trauma uh, itself, destroyed a number of times, but one important one was in the year 1009, kind of, the, he's nicknamed the Mad Emperor uh, Al-Hakim from Egypt, destroyed the church, pretty much the ground, but as we know in archaeology, you can't really get, a, get rid of the foundations. So it's there. We were able to go back and fix it up. It was rebuilt and added on to. By this time, in the Middle Ages already, there are some new things added on to the story about the site, including the legend of the true cross. I'm sure you've heard about this. We'll talk about it. The Crusaders came, left their mark, and enclosed the whole uh, complex, which included a number of different sites associated with the last days of Jesus, including the site of the crucifixion, the burial, the first century tomb. So we're leading to the idea here that there are some things we could prove. And I'm not here to prove faith. That's something completely different. But archaeology can help us understand the story, not only of the site, but link it to some very important pivotal historical events. Now, the edicule, which we'll talk about in a minute, uh, was built over the original tomb. This edicule it marks the spot. So when you go there in the Holy Sepulchre today, you go to the edicule, you can visit where the tomb complex was considered to be, at least in the Byzantine period. Fires, earthquakes had their, left their mark here. 
Now, in the 1960s, a new rotunda was built over the whole thing. I'll show you that in a second. And the edicule, however, remained in really poor condition. The question is, how do we fix it up? There is a complex hierarchy of authority in the church. Six different groups of Christians, some very old, like the Syriac and the Ethiopian rites. All the various groups, Orthodox, Catholic, they have to agree on everything that's done. Everything. You want to move that chair over here and put it over there? We've got to have a meeting. <laughs> now think about this when it comes to the actual sacred site itself, the tomb complex itself. The, etic the, uh, the eticule, which covers this whole thing, is made of stone, part wood, and it was cracking. It was in danger of falling down. And it reached sort of a fever point in the ninth, early late 1990s when Martin Biddle and others and then the National Geographic came along and said, we, we have, they have no choice. The church leaders agreed, repairs had to be done. That's where we get to the end of the story here today. All right, now let's just take a look at the site itself. So what you're looking at there, and this first slide showed you a bigger picture of this, is the entrance, the most holy place in Christendom, at least for the Western church. Maybe not the Protestants, but the Catholics, and, okay? But this is kind of unassuming. When I take students there every year to, to Jerusalem, when we we're on our weekends in Jerusalem, and they go there, they're like, this is the most holy spot, spot in Christianity. You know? Isn't it Rome? No, nope, it's here. All right, so uh, what's fascinating about it is that it's not polished. In other words, it's got a lot of flavor to it. When you enter this building, you are entering a building that has its foundations in the first century all the way up to today. It's just amazing. All right, so here's the edicule strange word we don't use. It's sitting under the rotunda. The rotunda is the dome above, which was built up again in the 1960s, but, you know, fixed up. But how do you fix up this monster? Now, this is actually restored at this point, what you see here. Uh, but there was scaffolding all around it, and they had to come up with a way to honor the site and never close it to the public. This is an open place of worship, so it can't be closed according to Israeli law, except in very rare circumstances. COVID did close it down for a little while. So that was the problem. How do you do the work? It had to be done at night, and it couldn't be done the way we would like to may perhaps do this in archaeology, which in Israel what we do is we start hacking away at things and getting down to the levels and destroying everything above it. Well, we can't do that here. So there was a unique uh, challenge here. What is absolutely fascinating for me is that whenever I go here and other places in Jerusalem around the world, is the evidence of, of, of how it moves people. It's just, well, it's moving to watch it. Uh, here you can see people leaving um, uh, votives and lighting candles. It is also very ornate. There is countless numbers of art, uh, beautiful pieces of art, mosaics, traditions that go all the way back to the fourth century. Uh, here, what you're seeing is uh, the chapel above the um, Golgotha itself. Uh, you can see the rich uh, work in mosaic or tile work and painting, uh, incense lamps, all this other stuff that's going on, all the various uh, languages that are being spoken here and chants and all this other stuff. Very active place. A um, lot of places in this church, it's huge. People don't go because they go to the main, the main ones, and I'll show you what those are. Now, where is it? This is the old city of Jerusalem. You can see the walls around it and the black lines. Uh, well, I have a fancy thing here. So here are the walls around the old city. These walls were only put up, restored in the 16th century by Suleiman the Magnificent. In the Middle Ages and during the Crusades, they were, the walls of Jerusalem were often thrown down to prevent a siege. So they are sitting on top of Roman walls that go way, way back. So these walls are, you know, quite, are very ancient, all the way back to first century and before that. Uh, the, the city, the old city itself is divided into four quarters, Muslim, Christian, Armenian, and Jewish. The Christian quarter is over here, and the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is right there. All right, so here is the Temple Mount for orientation. This triangular, uh, not uh, rectangular uh, box holds up 
where the former Jewish temples used to stand and were destroyed. Now, what's there right now? The Dome of the Rock, which is a shrine in the Muslim tradition, in Islamic tradition, um, honoring this, the foundation stone on the Temple Mount. The Holy Sepulchre is over here in the Christian quarter. So that's the orientation. And then let's take a look how it got there. Now, the National Geographic uh, did a tremendous amount of work and sponsored the work in the most recent restoration projects and the archaeology. And they did a fantastic uh, uh, number of drawings that get us to understand the site itself. So this was a quarry. There's documented evidence about this. Uh, why the quarry here? Because of a specific type of limestone that was very prized in Jerusalem. If you go to Jerusalem, you will see certain Jerusalem stone, it's called. A very sort of, a little bit of a pink hue to the, to the um, limestone. It's also quite strong. Limestone can also crumble away quite easily, but this is desirable. Frequently, when you have a quarry situation, at least in the first century BC and AD, uh, this became a place for uh, tombs. The, the rock was already worked. It was relatively easy to cut into it. And so this became an, an operational quarry and then a bit of an overlap and a cemetery. So that checks out. How do we know that? We can date, this, we can date the tombs. Okay, so it's at this point, important to keep this in mind, this is outside the city walls of Jerusalem as it extended, existed at that time. Okay, because that is important for the story. In Jewish tradition and other traditions, you can't bury a body inside of a city walled city, you bury it outside. So this is outside the city walls um, on the site where the Holy Sepulchre now stands. Okay, you can see uh, the, the bishop here going downstairs uh, there is a way, to, I haven't figured it out yet, but there is a way to f get in a tour behind the scenes or under the scenes, I should say, uh, to get under the church itself, and it's vast. Some of the shops that are close by in the old city, um, if you go into the shops and you can ask the right way, they'll take you downstairs and they'll say, these are the foundations of the original church. It's, it's just absolutely amazing. You know, a thriving shop above, you know, at street level, you go downstairs, here's a well, here's, a, here's some walls and so on. So the site was, it checks out as a quarry and a tomb complex. Now, you can see the city wall here as it existed at the time of Jesus, okay? The city wall here, this is outside. The quarry is there. Golgotha is considered to be here, and then the tomb itself is here. Now, what is Golgotha? There was a lot made about the fact that it's the shape of the limestone. There's like two eyes and a mouth and all that sort of thing. There is something that matches that description that the Protestants prefer outside the city walls today and across the street. Um, I don't know if we have time to get to that part. So suffice to say, Golgotha is considered to be the place where you, you have skulls. <laughs> it's a place of crucifixion. Can this be corroborated? Yes, but that doesn't matter for us to prove this necessarily, but there's still a lot of proof uh, out there. All right, so let's take a look here. What's a first century um, Jewish cemetery or tomb complex look like? You've heard about the story, especially around Easter, um, many of you perhaps, that when Jesus was placed in the tomb, there was a stone that was rolled in front of it. That is the case. That did occur. This was a pretty common way of burial. Uh, bodies were uh, placed on slabs such as this, and in some cases, there are numerous of them. This is in the north at Bet Sha'arim in northern Israel, which is a complete Jewish necropolis from the second century. It's absolutely stunning and surprising how much was put into these tombs. And the symbols that are on their ossuaries and their sarcophagi, that kind of blew us away. These, this was found in the 1930s. Nonetheless, we have quite a bit of, bit of evidence uh, archaeologists are a bit weird. We like tombs. So, you know, here we are. So the story checks out that way. Look at this beautiful ossuary uh, that was found. Which one is it? This is at the Church of the Flagellation Museum. Now, this is the second station on the Via Della Rosa, the Way of the Tears. It's our uh, place of tears. You can proceed through Jerusalem to these various places and see where certain events happened in the Passion story. There is a museum there that they open only in the last few years in, in this place, a beautiful little church, restored, Gothic, but right next to it they have a museum of the first century, 
which is stuff they found just on their site. And it goes on and on and on. Daily use materials, glass bowls, jewelry, you know, everything that makes up a life. But these ossuaries are absolutely stunning. You can see here the rich ornamentation here. And up here, very common in the first and second centuries, the rosette, which is a symbol for Jerusalem itself. So um, lots of things to uh, corroborate the stories. Now, in the book of Matthew, we get the, the story here, a, a verse that says, they came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There's that in Matthew. Uh, Joseph took the body of Jesus and placed it in a new tomb that he had cut out of the rock, rolled a big stone in front of it. That checks out as far as customs. And in John 19, it says that the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden. Well, that's something else we can prove. Was it a garden? Was it a quarry? All of this stuff, this has checked out. So I'm not, again, not trying to say we can prove Jesus was buried right there because we can't in the end, but faith has to take over at some point. The archaeology comes to tell us what it was, you know, when, maybe how, and maybe why, but not always why. That's all right. So one of the places that I find people miss when they go into the Holy Sepulchre is here's a drawing, a cutaway, of the dome, the rotunda, and the edicule, and behind it, right behind it, where you can walk all the way around here, but behind it there is a entrance that looks just like this, uh, and very, again, unassuming. When you walk inside and you can see some of the students going in, you have to sort of crouch down, and what you enter into is a tomb, and it's been dated to the first century. So this gives us some basis, so it gave the early Christians some basis that this was you know, check, 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 it fit all the various criteria for the place. In other words, the place had to match the story. This will become very important to the early pilgrims. Um, here is a, another view of this. Okay? Now, there's a lot going on in this building. And the one bad part about it today, anyway, I think, well, I can understand both. When you go there, you can't talk, but it's very loud. People talk. So thousands of people in there at any given time, unless you hit it just right, uh, but no tour guides because they don't want people to stop with the microphones and do all this t discussing while people are praying and you know visiting this very holy site. Uh, that still goes on, and the poor priests are running around telling people, get out, you have shorts on, and all this other stuff that goes on. Um, nonetheless, this is a very interesting building. So let's go through how a usual person, how a, a normal sort of itinerary, not a normal person, there's no such thing. All right, here's the, the current entrance. You enter to, in the side of the church. Over here, at the far east side, would be like the new city, or the old city, sorry. So this is already very populated, very built up. All right, so you enter there where the green arrow is, and normally people go right straight ahead and they find the stone of unction and a huge mosaic behind, tile behind here. The stone of unction is about, say, eight feet long and about three and a half feet wide or so. And it's sitting right there as you enter in. You can't miss it. And above it are some lamps and oil and this type of thing. And people are automatically drawn to that. They bring candles. They bring rosaries. They bring all this sort of stuff. It's just very interesting to watch this and to see the emotion that, that they uh, show. Um, and never mind that we don't have to tell them it was only put there in the 1800s. <laughs> they think it's the stone that Jesus was laid when he came off the cross. Doesn't matter, we don't want to ruin anybody's experience. Nonetheless, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad to understand all this stuff. Um, anyway, so people go in, and normally they head right away for the tomb, which makes sense. That's the whole point of this. Okay, so uh, the next iteration, the next uh, stop should be, if you take an immediate right, you go up the stairs, a very narrow set of stairs, very claustrophobic sort of stairs, and you end up in a chapel of Golgotha. And there is a limestone face of the original rock, the bedrock, that is incorporated into the church, and it's considered to be the place of the crucifixion. Okay, you can see the black outline here, where the, how the, the rock actually looks. Now, you would never know this when you visit this because it's leveled off. 
There's a place for prayer. You can touch the stone. And all kinds of different traditions were attached to this particular site, including the crucifixion of Jesus. Okay? So we'll, we'll revisit this in a moment. So the next step would be to go over here. And you can see the first century tomb behind the eticule. That's a good thing to have. And then if you know enough, many people don't know enough to go here because again, guides aren't necessarily telling you. You have to do all the discussion outside. And by the time you have a group go to the eticule and you know, touch the stone and touch the tomb and all that sort of thing, it could take hours. So you, you, know, you gotta get to the next spot and lunch. Of course. Nonetheless, you can go downstairs, um, very grand staircase, uh, huge grand staircase, and you can go into two different sort of chapels, which we'll show you better pictures here in a moment. One is the, temp the chapel of the True Cross. The other one is an interesting piece called the Early Pilgrim Ship, which I'll talk about in a second. All right, so let's take another look at this. In Jesus' time, Golgotha was considered to be here, this tomb garden complex. Now, at the time, this wall was not here at all. This was put up in about 38 AD or so, uh, uh, less than a decade after Jesus uh, would have lived, uh, would have died there. So the wall was roughly ended there. So it, it does check out that this was outside the city walls at the time. All right. The Golgotha was there, and then the site of the Holy Sepulchre will be there. That's the new wall that was put up in the Roman period. Now, after Jesus, okay, okay, after Jesus, there's a revolt, and the Emperor Hadrian renamed the city Alia Capitolina in the province of Palestina. That's how we get that name. Palestine. That's how it comes, right there. All right. In his attempt to more or less outlaw Judaism, he makes Jerusalem into a Roman city, first class. And so at the time, he in the Temple Mount, he put up a very large temenos, which is a platform. And there we think there is a Jupiter temple put up there. Then over here in this part of town, which will become the Holy Sepulchre, he levels the area off, as we said, and he puts up a temple to Venus on top. Now, this will come very important into our story. And what, what is important about the Council of Nicaea? Let me just check my notes to keep me on track here. So, during the Council of Nicaea, there was a bishop at that point from Jerusalem, his name Macarius. And he argued at that council that Jerusalem should be given special status. In the seventh canon or stipulation at Nicaea, the status of Jerusalem was explicitly because of the customs and ancient traditions already associated to that site in the fourth century. The emperor, Constantine, deemed it necessary to bring to light in Jerusalem the blessed place of the resurrection of the Savior so that all might be able to see and venerate it. Marcarius wrote, about the site, it is the witness to the resurrection, the place of the saving sign, and a memorial of eternal significance. So already at this point, Jerusalem was transformed into what is called the New Jerusalem. This is not necessarily new in how religious uh, sites are uh, incorporated into later traditions and built over, this type of thing. So they're making a statement here. Now, this is not from Jerusalem, but it is a typical way a temple to Venus looked in the Roman world. We think it looks something like this. Now, what do we have about this? We have excavations that sh give, give us the foundations for the Hadrianic leveling. There are some walls from this period incorporated into the Holy Sepulcher today. Okay? Now, Eusebius is a bishop. He's in Caesarea, which is on the coast. But he writes an early church history, one of the most complete at the time and quite early. And he writes about this site, the sacred place, he calls it. And he talks about that the Romans were, you know, impious and godless and all of that sort of thing. And they put up a temple to obscure the truth, which is the truth of Jesus, of course. Accordingly, they brought a quantity of earth, they leveled it off, and there they built a gloomy shrine 
of lifeless idols to Venus. Okay? He talks about this. Now, this is very interesting because they actually use for the first time that we have in recorded history about the need to excavate. If we want to get to the older stuff, we've got to go below ground and excavate. So they passed the first day of archaeology school right there. Okay? They supposed that their object could hide the truth, but they knew the story would come to life and Jerusalem would be itself reborn when the truth came. Now, Queen Helena's mission was to come here, sent by uh, Constantine. He sent her here and she lavished her bounties on the site. She explored the site with enormous discernment, which meant that she felt that certain things occurred in certain places. And she went around and she named them. Now, she had a number of churches established, Bethlehem, in, uh, at the Nativity, and other places in, in and around Jerusalem. And she embellished the sacred grotto with rich adornments. All right? Asubius comes back and says that once the ground was removed, they could get to the truth. And what the truth is that they're talking about here is that the place would be linked to historical events and the, the New Testament texts. So they were very sure about this. Now it's interesting, the perspective about archaeology with the Christian groups, Muslim groups, and Jewish groups. Here, they're trying to, in a sense, prove a historical event, the crucifixion, resurrection of Jesus. So the more you can gain from this, the more proof you have, the better. So that's sort of the way they look at this. In the Muslim tradition, uh, Islamic tradition, they don't look at it that way. They say faith is enough. Okay, two ways to look at this. All right. So we have some interesting early pilgrims. Now imagine, this one, we know a little bit less about the person, but the Bordeaux pilgrim left an itinerary. Now, pilgrim records are very important because they give us a sense of what was going on in time. This is from 333 already. There were people who were leaving northern Europe to travel. Can you imagine how they had to travel to get here? Now, at this time in 333, there is a structure already built. But what's interesting about it is it's not what we see today. What we see today is the whole, the whole site being incorporated into one structure that appears to be unified, but it's not, in a sense. So what did he write about? We think it's a he. He talked about the proof of why the site is where it is. What is it honoring? What is it meant to mark? And the, uh, the important thing to, for the, him was the tomb itself. So, so we think today, like entrance, number one is the entrance today, and here is Golgotha, which is around this area, and then over here the tomb complex. They are separate. When you enter here from the street, you go through the basilica, which is brand new in his day, and you have as a site, site number one is Golgotha, where the uh, crucifixion occurred, and then, as he says here, a little bit different, a little bit distant, is the tomb complex itself. All right, so that's how, how this, the original church was put up. Uh, something like this. Now, the Cardo Maximus is a fancy name for the main street of the city uh, in the Roman world. You can walk on it today in Jerusalem. Parts of it are exposed, so you can actually go there. There's a shopping district. It was a main thoroughfare, this type of thing, um, and it still is. <laughs> now, the Madaba, Madaba map is from Jordan in the 6th century, so the 500s, and it shows some interesting things that give us a little bit of perspective about what they perceive to be a very important site, which is the Holy Sepulcher, as it's mentioned here, or as it's shown here. Here's a different map. What, they sh what we don't see, all of it, is sort of a map of the world in mosaic, and what's at the center? Jerusalem. And what's at the center of Jerusalem? The Holy Sepulcher. This is the new Axis Mundi, if you will, the center of everything. Here is the, the Holy Sepulchre. There's the Cardo, so that checks out. And then there's another church that maybe you've not heard of, which is called the Nia Church, N-E-A, which is dedicated to Mary, which we've only recently started to uh, find evidence of because it's, again, under uh, domestic architecture today. It's in the Jewish quarter. Uh, it was monumental. It was one of the biggest churches that was destroyed, uh, we think, by an earthquake. But the foundations have been found. So Jerusalem here is now the center of the world. 
In the Jewish concepts about this, where's the center of the world? The Temple Mount. There's a number of traditions associating the Temple Mount with the place of the uh, creation of Adam, the gar original garden, and the two temples. So in the Jewish world, that's the center over there. Um, in the Christian, they had to make a new statement. And they had all they needed in the fact that Jesus was now buried over here, and this is the most holy site for the new Jeru Jerusalem. Now, by the fourth century, there is a, a little bit of a reference here that Adam's burial occurred at this site. His skull was buried beneath the site itself, which might have some play on the word Golgotha, which means skull. It might have a little association there. Now, St. Jerome at the time said, this is just a popular interpretation. <laughs> we have to be careful. Now, what's the um, umphalos? Hope I said that right. It's a Greek word for navel. It means the center of the world. Usually in Greek mythology, it's associated with, uh, you know, Delphi, I think, or in that area. Okay, not an expert there. Here's a map of the world from the 16th century. Jerusalem's dead center. Jerusalem is dead center. Now, one of the most missed things, I think this is fantastic, in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, you see the chapel here, the Orthodox chapel, which is opposite the rotunda. People sort of walk by it, because you, first of all, you can't get all the way in. It's blocked off. But right inside there, you can see right here, this strange little thing sitting in the middle of the floor. And I don't know why it's not made a bigger deal, but this is the Amphalos. So in the late 12th, in the 12th century already, they're talking about that when one enters the Lord's Sepulchre, there is a circle there which the Lord is said to be, was in the middle of the world. The Holy Sepulchre becomes the center of the world with this uh, uh, reference here. Over here, you can see it's quite <laughs> easy to miss, I guess. And there's a donation box, of course, right next to it. <laughs> the center of the world. Now, this woman blows me away. The pilgrimage of Igeria, I think it's Igeria. We think she's from northern Spain. She went, decided, why not, go on a four-year mission throughout the Near East and visit all these places. Now, this tells you something about what the, how the word has spread already to far fun places without Instagram and all that other stuff. So she visited Jerusalem from around 381 to 384 and she wrote an extensive itinerary. This is very important for us because she gives us something that we didn't have before uh, at all. We didn't know about Christian rituals. Like what did they do? What did they say? Where did they go? We have some of these itineraries like Bordeaux said, I went, I went to Mount Sinai and I went over here to Mount Nebo, and then I went here. They didn't really say what was going on there too much. This is an early one, but look how early it is, 383 or so. Pilgrimage has a goal, and Christian pilgrimage has a specific goal to visit the sites where Jesus lived, or important figures in Christian history, right? It's like, go to those places. I will tell you, having been to Israel 30-some plus times and seen you know, groups, Jewish or Christian, you get on the bus at 7 a.m., <laughs> You get off here at the Loaves and Fishes Chapel, you get on the bus, and you go over here to the Mount of Beatitudes, and you go there, you get on the bus, you go buy postcards, you go over here, da, 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 and you get off the bus at 7 p.m., and you do that day after day. What happened here? Sermon on the Mount. What happened over here? The, the Loaves and Fishes story. All of that stuff is, okay, we're going to trace the steps. There's a couple of different ideas about pilgrimage. Like getting up and going. Bishop uh, Gregory of Nyssa said Christians should be more concerned with spirituality. And Jerome, he's an interesting guy, I think, said he was annoyed by misinformed guides, <laughs> which is still happening today, by the way. Uh, Igeria's writings describe the early Christian literature. So let's take a look a little bit here. Now, she's in Jerusalem in about 383. This is about f not even 40 years after the first basilica was placed over the site, or near the site. Now she gives us what actually happened, because she participated. This is the first we have a Christian liturgy that actually tells our you know, progression from site to site, and it's instructive. Um, 
you, you, you should know what the order of service is in these holy places. Every day before the cockro, uh, so dawn, the doors of the Anastasis are open. What is that? That's another term for the tomb complex itself. So what she's describing is you go here, the doors are open, and then all the monks come, and the virgins, right, and all the people, men, women, and they begin their vigil early. So there's a group of people already there. And from what hour to day, from that hour to daybreak, hymns are said and psalms are sung, and antiphones like responses are in like manner, and prayer is made after each of these hymns. So you can start to see here that people were engaging already in the in the in the ritual at a particular place. The bishop comes with the clergy, and he goes into the cave. Now the cave is considered to be the tomb complex itself. We don't know what it looked like exactly but we know that there was a, a rotunda already placed over this, the anastasis. And everyone approaches the, his hand and he blesses them and so on. And this goes on throughout the day. Vespers, meaning er, uh, evening prayers. It happens again. There's a light that comes, uh, that comes um, that lights the candles, but that is not introduced from outside. It's brought from within the cave. So you're actually placing the, the locus of the uh, major event, the, cruci the burial, from that cave becomes the light, and then everyone can partake in that. The lamp is burning all the time. So we get a little bit of um, uh, insight into what was going on there. And then they go to the cross. Now, from what we get from here, the cross and the, the tomb complex were separate entities, freestanding, apparently. They weren't incorporated into one building like they are today. All right? So you can start to see how... Uh, rituals were laid on here. Now, in her day, just after her, after this, 325, uh, the, the, the Golgotha, the cross, was apparently freestanding because she talks about people being able to circulate around it where the crucifixion took place. And then, as she says, a stone's throw away to the burial chamber, which is there. All right? Now, I, I just want to mention this briefly. It's the chapel of St. Vartan's, which is in the lower level. And when you go down there, you can see in, in, framed in the stone a carving of a ship. Uh, quite a bit was made, of, uh, was made about this as being evidence of a first century uh, pilgrim coming here. And for a while that stood until more recent um, um, explorations and research indicated that it was probably part of the fourth century tomb complex. Uh, you have to go downstairs. It's not open to everyone. You have to go downstairs here with special permission, and you can see that you have a ship. And there's various ways to read this, apparently. Um, one way to say it is, Lord, uh, what to read it is, Lord, we have gone, and another version might be, Lord, we have come. So there seems to be already pilgrims coming. Again, we have a couple other accounts of this. Uh, in the Crusader period, the church has expanded. This is the major goal of the Crusaders, so-called, to get there and take this place back, fix it up, and they do enlarge it. At this point, they enlarge the whole thing and incorporate the whole thing into one complex. They also leave a great deal of graffiti. You can see through the walls here on some of the walls, they left crosses that they chiseled into the, into the stones to say, I was here in this place. It looks something like this, which is more or less what we see today. Uh, this is the, two, the whole complex now covered in one continuous building and all the various um, attractions, if you will. Don't mean to be coarse about this, but uh, this, the Golgotha is enclosed, and then it will become a chapel itself, and so on. So it becomes uh, one unified building. Uh, it's stunning. If you get a chance to go here, by all means go. Um, the Rotunda complex is it's just stunning. When you think about the 2,000 years of people coming here and wanting to be here, uh, that's, that goes for many places within Jerusalem. Uh, just that passion that people have for this. Um, the architecture is very confusing. I don't know of anyone who could do a real proper tour easily and say, you know, we have a column over here and some stones from the 3rd century and from the 5th and the 12th. It's, it, it's all jumbled together. And for people who are coming here, they're visiting the tomb, pure and simple, for, for the most part. Um, then, as now... There were many ways to buy souvenirs. <laughs> these are, uh, there are also like pilgrim badges that one could get when you visited these places and they're stamped. 
like fourth century, fifth century, sixth century, they're, they're stamped. They're like, like little uh, commemorative coins. I visited Capernaum. <laughs> I was here. I was there. And so these are pilgrim flasks. And they show us something quite interesting. This is called an ampulla from Jerusalem, but depictions of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre front and two warrior saints in the background, on the backside. Um, uh, they're made out of uh, lead, made in Jerusalem. Probably sold right outside like today. You can buy incense candles, crosses, olive wood, everything, da 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 da. All right. Uh, so here's the chapel where the true cross was found. Down here at this rather unassuming place, this is the chapel of the finding of the true cross, which does not really come a thing until the, the crusaders make it a thing. So we'll talk about that for a second. You can see here some of the graffiti or marks, all these crosses that were stamped into the stone that identified crusader period people coming here. Um, some of the stones themselves were used as relics. They were reused from the earlier periods and incorporated into the church. So the stones themselves being at the site were relics themselves. Um, you've probably heard about the true cross. Um, it already in the fourth century, there's a, there's a, there's a bit of a reference to this, that it was found and the holy wood of the cross was seen among us to this day. It made it everywhere. The pieces of the true cross. Here, I was just in Florence this last uh, May, and uh, there were too, too many of these, uh, too, too numerous of these to show, so I'm showing one, the true cross, and a piece of the crown of thorns. This is from Florence, Santa Croce. Um, also, other uh, relics, such as the Spear of Longinus, was discovered in 1098 in the first, by the first crusaders and given to a pope, and then later it was lost, and you know, this whole thing. The true cross discovery, though, is not really a prevalent as a, as a tradition until the, say, 11th, 12th century, even though it's attributed by some back to Helena. Well, how did Helena know it was the true cross, according to legend? They found three, three crosses conveniently, right? You know, the two that were uh, crucified, the thieves, were they? Thieves. Um, and then the true cross. Well, how do you know which is the true one? You've got to get it right. And it's, by, by the way, um, we have wood preserved because of the nature of the climate and everything. It is not uncommon for us to find 2,000-year-old wood. That's not a problem. Uh, but the problem is, how do you attribute it to what? So what you have to do is you have to go find a sick person and you hold the cross up to the person and, you know, whiz bang, boom, boom, it's all cured. And another tradition came that it wasn't just a sick lady, it was a dead guy. So put the cross, up he comes, there's your cross, there's your true cross. So this made it throughout most of Europe. Um, uh, what does it do? Brings a person who can't get there, there. They're invested in the story in a different way. I love relics. People say, this is so weird. Yeah, the finger bone of Saint so-and-so. I love it. <laughs> anyway, restorations in the complex have been ongoing. Um, there was a major earthquake, uh, 1808, which caused real problems for the edicule, real cracks. So the documentary that is still out there, um, you may have to tinker a bit with like signing up for a National Geographic or whatever, called The Secret of Christ's Tomb, and it's about this, which I'm going to talk about, and we'll finish here. Um, Martin Biddle, since 1999, started to uh, come to the church and say, we, you know, he was sort of interested in finding out the layers of the edicule itself, which surrounds the tomb. This is the problem, is that you can't close it. As I said before, People need to keep continue to come here, so they put scaffolding up because they were very concerned it was going to fall down. And you don't want that. So um, there it is. It was under construction for a number of years. And really concerned about how to do this. Now, they had to go and go to the committee, right? We're going to dig into the tomb complex. Now think of the risk here. 2,000 years of Christian tradition is pretty much on the line if we start pulling things out of this thing. What happens if we get in there and then it's a tomb from centuries before or after? What are we going to do? So I give them credit for saying, number one, we gotta, we, the more we know, the more we, we know. And it's not going to change faith anyway, and it shouldn't. Okay, so here we go. So this uh, fascinating place, 
they had to figure out a way to, number one, reconstruct it and fix it up. They did. But then while they were there, they decided they had to uh, fix the tomb itself. So when you walk in here, it's often very hectic. You get about a split second to be in there. You put your hand, you touch something, you walk away, you've had your experience. That's great. But you don't really get a chance to look around. Like, what is this thing I'm looking at? It's basically a sarcophagus that's incorporated into the walls. And it's so tiny. And usually, my experience has been, whenever you go in there, there's always a priest of some sort in there or a, you know, an official of someone, cr uh, uh, clergy. And usually while you're having your experience, whatever it is, they're like, you know, donations, candles, donations. <laughs> this occurs everywhere in Jerusalem, by the way. Uh, but it's like, get out of here. <laughs> All right, so again, there are a number of different uh, con constituencies that are responsible for this site. They agreed it's time to do some work here. So one interesting factoid, though, I want to tell you about is because they couldn't agree on who should lock the door <laughs> at night. This goes way back to the Crusader period. Did you know this, that the one who holds the key is a Muslim family? For 500 years, they've held the key to the Holy Sepulchre, and they consider it a huge honor. This is already from, uh, like, uh, 15, uh, before 1500s. Same family. They passed the key down. So, um, the, what's the name of the family? Al-Husseini family. Fascinating stuff. All right, so... Here's the big moment. You know, the documentary goes into all this. They start to take away the tomb covering. Can you imagine? They have a pretty big moment of drama here. What's in there? What if there was a skeleton? <laughs> Can't destroy it. Okay. Nonetheless, before they did all this, they realized they, they put some what they call ground-penetrating radar, but let me tell you the secret. What they really used was a colonoscopy could be scope. <laughs> Sounds better to have all these fancy names. They put it in there and they wove it through and they could find the various layers of the construction of this thing, which is fascinating. But they needed to do a little bit more, including they could test the mortar that uh, held everything together and they were able to come up with a whole range of dates that fit exactly the major reconstructions and um, building processes that we know from textual references. Fascinating stuff. So they pulled the thing back, they got inside, and they were able to confirm that the mortar sample, the, 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 the weight of the evidence from textual traditions and so on and so forth is that it fits to the Constantinian period. So the, this was the spot where originally Constantine and others said this is where the tomb occurred. Now remember, the setting of this whole thing. It's the first century tomb complex. So it checks, it checks out really interestingly. What they were able to find through mortar analysis of testing the mortar through this luminescence process is that the phases of the mortar uh, by testing were the 4th century, 11th, 16th, and 19th. All of them correspond to like earthquake events and rebuildings, destructions, rebuildings, and the original foundation of the church. So the church itself is that ancient. Of course, uh, pottery is a very important um, factor for dating things. Here's a look inside the tomb complex itself. Um, I want to just sort of end with this. Uh, Martin Biddle was, you know, describing the National Geographic, sorry, scholar was uh, talking about this, but what, what is more important here is Dan Bahat, an Israeli Jewish um, head archaeologist of Jerusalem. Can you imagine that job? the head archaeologist for Jerusalem. And he wrote some interesting articles and he talks about, and he's in some of these documentaries about this work because he was supervising at the time. Um, it's interesting because of the status quo situation with holy sites, the Israelis don't have jurisdiction here. It's a very interesting thing. So, but they are interested in you know, making sure things are safe and they certainly don't want to diminish traffic with pilgrims from any stripe. So uh, he, he says, and it's very true, we cannot be absolutely certain that the site of the Holy Sepulchre is the site of Jesus' tomb. But we can certainly, we have no other site that fits the claim as weighty. And what we mean by that is the, 
the, the original foundations, the first century tomb, the pilgrim accounts, and all the various traditions that go with this, including Eusebius. And we have to always, in this type of investigation, we have to weed out the legendary from, you know, but it adds to the story. And so for today, when people go there now, they have a much safer edicule they can visit. And I think it's fascinating. And still that we don't know is even better, for sure, that it was that particular person. I've dug for 12 years looking for King David. We have never found King David, but we certainly found all the stuff around King David. You know, the, the traditions that fix up, uh, go to this. I'm sure I'm over time. Do we have one minute? All right. <laughs> Wasn't sure I'd get here. Now, Protestant response is different. When I take students from the area, Oakland, and we go, many of them don't really care about religion, but they're fascinated about sites like this. What I find fascinating is that some, most all of them have a Christian background. I don't know, I don't ask them like what branch or anything like that, but when they go to the Holy Sepulchre, nine out of 10 of them are really turned off. And I said, well, well, I love all these places. I said, which place was your favorite? Of all the religious sites and different places we visited, the Western Wall, which is a wall. Yes, very important. And they say, I understand the history there. I don't understand the history here. I don't like the incense. I don't like all the, the, this other stuff. So I don't know what that means, except let's talk about the Protestant view of this. Now, there's an interesting American explorer called Edward Robinson, Protestant. And he went to the Holy Sepulchre. He, he, he writes about it in his book, 1838, which I got on eBay, the original copy, uh, for cheap. And he talks about going to the Holy Sepulchre around Easter time. And he says, this is the most ridiculous thing, I'm paraphrasing, that I've ever seen, this monkish fantasy that they're pulling off here. The fire and the wailing and the this and the icons and all that. Fooey for a Protestant. And he says, by the way, he's not, an, he's not an archaeologist, but he says, by the way, I will prove to you this is not the site of Jesus' burial. Why? Because he got himself, he was very interested because he tells us what he did. He took paper and a ruler and a measuring sticks and things like this because he wasn't an archaeologist, he was a textual scholar and a linguist. And he was sitting, we think, somewhere over here. It must have been around the Jaffa Gate or so. Because if you get up high enough around the Jaffa Gate, you can see most of the old city. And he says, look, guys, there is no way this was the tomb of Jesus. Why? Because in Robinson's day, this wall was already here. He says, simple. There was a, the walls over there, the tombs in there, that didn't happen. The tomb had to be outside the city wall. And he says, I don't know exactly where it is, but I do prefer a different site. And if I had to bet, because he didn't know, it would be over here to the north of the city, which then will become the place where the Protestants call the garden tomb. And when you go there, it's very peaceful, very quiet, and I'll show you something else. So he wrote about this, and he says, this is all hooey. Now a Protestant, he, he's, very, he's very biased. We would call him a very biased individual right now, but he would say, the monkish traditions that have been applied to this site have clouded reason. It's a very Protestant thing to do, I guess, right? We prefer a different site. So that's, that's his. Now, when you go across the street, out of the city walls, as they are today, and you go into East Jerusalem, you climb up a little bit of a hill, and you can see up on top a what is now a Muslim... Um, Cemetery up on top, and just over here beyond this wall is the Jerusalem bus station. <laughs> but here, what do we have? Nose, you got to stretch your imagination a little bit. This is Golgotha. This is where the skull is. So that's the thing. And lo and behold, you poke, you poke long enough in Jerusalem, you're going to find a first century tomb. He, they found one, checked out, same style, that whole thing, but it's much more peaceful not full of uh, incense and mosaics and all this other stuff going on. That is what he preferred. 
And the Protestants call this the garden tomb. And, and so for some groups, this is the place of Jesus. Burial. There it is. Okay. The text is enough for them. You know, that's, you don't need all this other stuff and luminescence, archaeology, and schmarchaeology, and all that other stuff. All right. Questions? Uh -huh.